In part one of this two-part episode, we're going to look at ZFS on Linux. I will cover the basics of what ZFS is, how to create and work with ZFS pools, along with how to recover from common failure modes. While researching this topic, it became clear that to really do it justice, I needed to split this episode into two parts. So the first part will act as an intro to ZFS, how to create and work with ZFS pools, along with recovering from failures. Then in the second part, we will look at some of the advanced features offered by ZFS, things like compression, data deduplication, quotas, and snapshots. ZFS was designed from the ground up to be a highly scalable, combined volume management and file system with many advanced features. This work took place almost 10 years ago by Sun Microsystems for their Solaris platform. In early 2010, Oracle acquired Sun Microsystems. Since the creation of ZFS, it has grown far beyond Solaris. For example, BSD has had a working ZFS port for almost seven years now. And ZFS is just recently becoming popular on Linux, as the port is becoming much more stable. Since ZFS has been around for so long, there is no shortage of great documentation. If you're interested in reading about why ZFS is so great, along with a little history, the ZFS wiki page is pretty good. ZFS on Linux is produced by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. I think this is worth talking about for a minute, as it adds some weight to the topic. Livermore is home to two of the fastest supercomputers in the world, ranked number 3 and number 9 out of the top 500. One of these top supercomputers, named Sequoia, just so happens to be running ZFS on Linux, which Livermore helped create. There is a great video about Sequoia's ZFS Luster implementation over on YouTube. I should also mention that there's a nice little community gathering around the ZFS on Linux project, so lots of people are using it now. Let's jump back to the ZFS homepage and get started with installing ZFS on our system. ZFS on Linux is basically a kernel module and user land tools that you can download, compile, and install. What is great about this is that you do not have to patch or recompile your kernel. ZFS is just a loadable kernel module. It is actually really easy to get going since there's packages for Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, and RHEL. And for each OS, it's just a matter of running a couple commands. I'm going to use CentOS on a virtual machine today, but the ZFS commands used throughout the demo should work across all Linux distributions. So let's get started. I'm running CentOS 6.5 here. I've also run yum update to install the latest updates. Specifically, I want to make sure that the kernel's up to date since the ZFS package is going to build kernel modules against it. Okay, so let's run these three commands from the ZFS on Linux website. The first one is going to install the Apple repository for supporting packages. The second command installs a yum repository for the ZFS installation packages. And finally, the third command installs ZFS and supporting packages. As you can see, the install process is building kernel modules. This works in a similar manner to how you would install third-party network or video drivers. I should also mention that this install process took about 10 minutes to complete, so what you're watching is actually a heavily sped up version. This last step is not required, but I thought it might be a good idea to reboot the machine, just to make sure everything is in a consistent state. Okay, so the machine has been rebooted. Let's just verify the version again. Next, let's verify the ZFS kernel modules have been installed by running lsmod and grepping for ZFS. Yeah, this looks good too, since we have a bunch of kernel modules loaded. Now that we've installed ZFS and verified that it's working, let's start to play around with it. For the demo today, I've added 10 disks to a VirtualBox VM. Let's just take a look at them by running ls dev sd star. The disks we're going to be using for ZFS today are SDB through SDK, and they're about 100 megs each. Let's just verify this by running fdisk-l dev sdk. I'm just going to go ahead and create a ZFS pool, and then we can review what this means. Let's type zpool create dash f e35 pool raid z2 sdb through sdi. So what does this command mean? Well, zpool is one of the two ZFS commands that you're likely going to use all the time. The other one is ZFS, but we're going to chat about that command more in episode part two. So here we're using the create option, which means we want to create a new pool. Then the dash f option to ignore disk partition labels. Since these are new disks, we just want to force ZFS to create them for us. Next, we need to provide a unique ZFS pool name for each array we want to create. In this case, we're using E35 pool. This name will make much more sense in a minute. Then we specify the RAID level. ZFS has its own terminology for RAID levels, but RAID Z2 is equivalent to RAID 6. 
meaning that we can have two failed disks in this array and still be OK. Finally, we specify the disks to use in this array. You can look at active ZFS pools by running zpool status. Here is the E35 pool we just created. It is online, and then down here you can see the RAID level, and the disks assigned to the software RAID. Pretty easy so far, right? While doing research for this episode, I came across several really cool resources, and I just wanted to take a minute and share them with you. The first one explains ZFS RAID levels really well, and it talks about some of the terminology. It talks about how RAID Z2 compares to RAID 6, but you can also create all sorts of RAID variations with ZFS. The second link is also really useful, and that it offers advice by someone who has clearly used ZFS extensively. It offers up many design suggestions and things you should watch out for. If you're going to be playing around with ZFS, and maybe looking at going into production, make sure you read this page. There's also this really useful RAID capacity calculator that I came across, and it just happens to support ZFS. You can input your RAID type, disk size, and the number of disks, and it will help you figure out the resulting RAID capacity. Finally, if you're interested in ZFS RAID benchmarks, here is this fantastic link. Like I was talking about earlier in this episode, there's just an astonishing amount of information about ZFS out there. So if you find yourself in a jam, it's likely that there's help out there. Okay, so let's go back to the demo. So we have our pool using ZFS software RAID Z2, which is equivalent to RAID 6, meaning that we can sustain two disk failures and still keep our data online. Before we go any further, let's run df-h and look at the output. You will notice that we have our E35 pool ZFS file system mounted as slash E35 pool. So the ZFS create command we used earlier in this episode not only created the ZFS software RAID, formatted it, but it also mounted it for us. Pretty neat. Just to show you how easy it is to create and destroy ZFS pools, let's destroy this pool using the zpool destroy command and then the pool name. In this instance, E35 pool. Then let's run zpool status to verify the pool is actually gone. Now let's create a RAID 10 by running zpool create dash f E35 pool mirror sdb sdc mirror sdd sde and hitting enter. Let's check it out by running zpool status. So here we have our E35 pool again, but this time we have a mirror, each with two disks. You can also run the zpool status list command to get the details about the pool. Let's just run df-h again just to verify that it's actually mounted. Okay, so that's creating and destroying pools in a nutshell. There's actually many more options to the zpool command, so let's just run zpool command without any arguments so that we get the help output. I'm going to scroll up to the top here and then we can work our way down. So you should already recognize some of these since we've actually reviewed create, destroy, list, and status. But as you can see, there are actually many, so let's look at a couple more. Say for example that you wanted to get some statistics about the pool. We can use the iostat option like this. zpool iostat e35 pool. This will give us detailed information about the capacity, operations, and bandwidth. But you can also get detailed information per device by running the same command just with the dash v option. Now the information is broken down by pool, mirror, and device. Let's briefly look at detecting data corruption and then dealing with failures. Oftentimes when things go bad, likely there will be a dead disk and it's obvious what needs to be done. Just replace the disk. A less common issue would be data corruption. So let's try and replicate that. Let's type zpool status again to see an overview of our pool. As you can see in our configuration discussed earlier, we have redundancy built in via our mirrors. So let's go ahead and corrupt the data on SDB by using the dd command to write zeros across the entire disk. Okay, now that that's done, let's type zpool status again, and you will notice that everything's okay, as it might take a bit for ZFS to notice that our data on SDB is actually bad. However, we can go ahead and force a data scrub. This is a ZFS terminology for a verify operation. Let's go ahead and type zpool scrub e35 pool, and then we can run zpool status again. Now you can see that ZFS picked up the issue with dev sdb as it crawled the pool looking for data integrity issues. There is even this action line which provides us with a command to fix our mirror. Down here you can also see the dev sdb device marked as corrupt. Let's go ahead and replace this bad disk with a good one via the zpool replace command. 
Let's type zpool replace, the pool name, so E35 pool, the bad device, SDB, and then the good device, let's say SDF. I'm just going to append the zpool status command here so that we can see the device rebuilding. You wouldn't normally do this, but since the virtual disks I'm using for this demo are so small, the rebuild happens really quickly. So I just wanted to make sure that we see the rebuild happening. Okay, so the status message has been updated. We can now see that our device is being resilvered. Again, this is ZFS specific terminology. Resilvering is equivalent to rebuilding. Down here you can see the rebuild happening, going from our bad device, SDB, to our good device, SDF. Let's run zpool status again, and you can see that everything is happy. Dealing with failures in ZFS is actually pretty painless. I just wanted to take a moment and share with you a couple more fantastic links for learning about ZFS. This 21-part guide is the most comprehensive set of documentation for ZFS on Linux that I've come across, and I just wanted to share it with you. And there's even a section on data scrubbing and resilvering, and it goes into great detail about how ZFS uses its knowledge of the file system to smartly repair data corruption. You should also check out the official Oracle Solaris ZFS administration guide. Even though the target is Solaris administrators, most, if not all of it, is compatible with ZFS on Linux. And if you're going to be using ZFS on Linux, maybe even in production, you'll likely want to refer to these pages quite a bit. Okay, so that marks the end of ZFS on Linux part number one. Please continue on to ZFS on Linux part number two, episode number 37, which will be linked to in the episode notes below when it's complete. All right, that concludes this episode. Thanks for watching. If you would like to get notified about future episodes, please subscribe to my mailing list. You can do this by going to the Get Notified link in the header and entering your email address. Have questions, comments, or concerns about this episode? What about episode ideas? I'd love to hear your feedback, either good or bad. Shoot me an email, justin at sysadmincasts.com.